thing is I get ads like I'll see ads come up in my uh, like just online for like my own stuff and it's never where I would think it was like all the monster stuff made it to like hot topic Wow. Yeah. Uh, high school high school Chris is really proud of himself. <laughs> Welcome to your local Cineplex. back welcome back to your local cineplex i just want to thank again everyone who listens to this podcast we're in season two and today my guest is chris kohler i'm mad looking at your artwork i'm like gosh there's another person who makes me just want to quit <laughs> that's good I, I want to quit too so <laughs> so chris in case people don't know who you are would you mind kind of just quickly introduce introducing yourself and uh if there's any pieces that you're like this is the piece i'm proud of uh yeah sure so hey i'm chris kaler i uh, i do a lot of poster art now but like for the bulk of my career i did more editorial so like magazines newspapers uh book covers ad work um just kind of all over the map really uh, but for the last, I would say, five or six years, just been going way harder on uh, poster illustration. I mean, I still think as far as the poster industry goes, I'm relatively unknown. I'm, I'm just kind of there in, in the background. Uh, but I've, uh, I've done work for Mondo, uh, just had a release with Bottleneck, uh, done a lot of stuff with Hero Complex and Gallery 1988 and um, some Lucasfilm stuff. Bulk of my poster work right now is working with Universal Studios. So I've been working with Universal for a couple years and that, that's been like the most um, fruitful and like best experience of my illustration career. I, I love those guys so much. <laughs> so, uh, most of that work though is uh, is very under the radar and anonymous so yeah or at least as of now yeah i've just just seeing your universal work i'm like oh this this is amazing <laughs> the, this, <and> the, <laughs> the monster work i'm a big universal monster fan and so it's that would be a dream for me is mm -hmm. to work on one of those oh and actually, that actually be yeah. partnered with the universal on that it's uh it's unreal to me that i that they work with me and that i'm allowed to do that i mean the monsters like i would have done that on my own no one needed me to no one needed to hire me to do that uh <laughs> i have uh next year i'm really excited because uh I, I i guess i can say this i'm doing uh, a bunch of work for the that is dino might for a certain anniversary coming up oh. next year so I'm really excited for that because that's a whole series of posters, and I think it's some of my better work. Really, Exciting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is the hard thing, right? As you finish like the monster work, it was like a year after finishing before those really started to like show up anywhere, and then oh, wow. you just see them pop up everywhere. Like the thing is, I get ads, like I'll see ads come up in my uh, like just online for like my own stuff. And it's never where I would think. It was like all the monster stuff made it to like hot topic. Wow. Yeah. Uh, high school. High school. That's Chris cool. is really proud of himself. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine so. Oh man, it's so like how's what's the experience with that? Working with you got a huge studio like Universal, so I'm, I'm assuming one may have some assumptions of how it's what it's like working with that. Do they give you a lot of creative freedom? it's type of stuff it's it's really tricky uh the 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 short answer is no i mean it's um the art directors i'm working with there are some of the best art directors i've ever worked with they're they're uh illustrators themselves they're designers they're total cinephiles and they're like they're brilliant there's just more considerations when working with the studio than you would have working for like a gallery 
uh, especially like unlicensed stuff, mm -hmm. is like anything goes, right? It doesn't matter. Right. When you work with Universal, it's like you have the consideration. The first consideration you have is like the art directors. And uh, the nice thing with them is like I trust them implicitly because they're so good at what they do that if they give me feedback 100% of the time, it's going to make the piece better. Right. So I'm really ha good. super happy to get feedback. Uh, but then you also, a lot of times, you have to deal with the layer of the uh, character design team and their responsibility is to, like, make sure everything matches up with the canonical design, right? Right. So if, for instance, you're doing a dinosaur with a frill, you have to make right. sure the pattern on the frill matches their official right. asset exactly. And if you do that wrong, say, like, four times in a row, and you have to revise it for a week, that's that's what it is, I'm, right. medically speaking. Um, and then uh, once you have, once you get past character, you still have to, you know, get past legal. And <laughs> and uh, a lot of times too, that involves uh, getting likeness approval from uh, whoever's giving the likeness approval, whether it's an estate, the actors themselves, or the studio. And at any step in this process, and usually at every step in this process, you have to revise. I will have a typical piece will go through like eight rounds of revisions from the time it's like the art is done to the time it's actually sent through. That's intense. Yeah. But I, I like to hear though that it's, you're definitely amongst a team that they know their stuff. <laughs> they know the IP. They're passionate about it. Oh yeah. So it's you're definitely part of this team that everyone is a pro, everyone knows what you're working on, and so it's you can trust each other and go, Yeah, we're all at the same common goal to make this amazing. Yeah, and uh, the really cool thing, I mean it's like working with movies we all love. It's not like Yeah. You know, it's not like I'm working on a trash movie. I'm not working on Air Buddies in space, which actually I would love to do a poster for Air Buddies. But like <laughs> Everyone loves the movies. Everyone is a film nerd. A lot of times, I'll get on. We'll get on calls, and you know, we'll go on some random tangent and just talk about. We'll talk about like Criterion stuff for, for twenty minutes. You know, they're they're mm -hmm. fantastic people, and uh, they're really good collaborators. It's uh, but after a certain point, you know, it's like okay, likeness is likeness. You can't you can't have that go wrong, right? Right. Right. It's a it's a difficult process for sure. I definitely would love to work for work with Universal on that. Do I guess is there talk about like they would want to do some more with you again? Yeah, I have a lot, a lot, a lot done with them um, in the last year, and then I'm on. Uh, I have three more pieces in progress for them now, oh. and then after that, I would love to keep working with them. I, I think I mean at this point, it's just like. Uh, it's not even like a job. It's like working with my friends. You know, they're they're so cool, and yeah, we have a. I would like to think we have like a really good working relationship. So I, I mean, for, for my part, it's like there's uh, that's the kind of work I want to do, right? And I, I would hope I can just do it as much as possible. I really prefer studio work to like gallery work because I am. Um, I don't like dealing with anything except the drawing, you know. Right. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not out here. I can't sell APs to save my life, so I'm not even trying. Yeah, yeah. You say that, and I'm kind of like intrigued by that because I'm I'm new to it, so I'm not. I'm trying to break into the industry, right? I'm trying to pretty much hit every kind of point of getting with the poster posse, getting with Hero Complex right. Gallery, and so I never considered that there's. A different experience doing a gallery versus working with the studio so like what's the difference there oh they're they're all really different i mean i think like every gallery is going to be every gallery every brand every studio is is going to be a little bit of a different experience i mean i'm i'm really fortunate at this point i've kind of worked with almost everyone and i will say i've had pretty much universally great experiences with everyone as well i mean give or take here and there you know i think everyone's going to have like some odd experiences in the industry but right. by and large it's it's been a fantastic experience but um i think when you're working with with galleries it's it's way more self-directed you know like if you take hero complex or like 
Gallery 1988 or uh, what's another one like that? You know, like even even Spoke. I, I haven't worked with Spoke though, but you could pitch ideas pretty easily. So if I have a crazy idea for a poster, I, I could reach out to Hero Complex and be like, do you do you think this would work? And they'll work with me on it, you know, and they'll be honest. They'll say like this. They'll be like, this is a really cool idea but the market might not be there. Or they'll be like, yes, do this. Let's 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 make this happen. There's there's a lot less barriers in that way. Uh, right. Some places like do a, do a split on sales. So it's like, it's really dependent on how well you sell. Uh, other places mm -hmm. will do a flat fee plus APs. And uh, so that's really dependent on your ability to have your own, cultivate your own fan base and sell your own prints as well to kind of like, make up a little more on on the back end there uh which which is something i'm absolutely horrible at and um like studio work is really different from all of it because it's you don't own anything you don't own the piece um you know it's part of their visual assets and right. for the most part too your name is not associated with it you know like the work i do out there my name is nowhere on it, it it's just part of the work um I mean, I think if you know my work, maybe you could recognize that it's me, but otherwise it's just like, it's one of those things. You'll see someone wearing a t-shirt of, you know, the creature from the Black Lagoon, and it, it might have been one of mine. <laughs> yeah, so you could just walk into Universal Studios Park, go to the gift shop, and boom, your work is there, and there's no association that would be with cool. you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at the same time, like, I, I don't mind being anonymous. It's kind of nice. I think it's, yeah, I never thought of it being two different worlds, working with the studio versus the gallery. I guess it makes sense. The gallery is more about you working as an artist versus with the studio, you're about that behind the scenes guy who's creating assets for them. It it's exactly like that's that. the difference. Yeah, I mean, if you're like working with Bottleneck, it's like a lot of the value is the, I mean, almost all the value is the artists themselves. You know, it's like, I am not, like if Daniel Danger could release a blank sheet of paper and I would probably buy it, you know, <laughs> like right. anything he does, I'm, I'm going to be in line. Right. Cause I just respect him and his work so much. Like there is, you have to push the name because the name is like so much of where the value comes from, especially for like collectors. Whereas like studio work, they just want the visual asset and the visual asset has to be, it, it also has to be, I mean, excuse the pun, but it has to be universal in, in the sense that ah. you have to be able to take an image and potentially put it on a t-shirt, put it on a poster, you know, put it on a notebook, mm. and it has to work in different contexts and it has to have a more of a universal appeal. Whereas right. in the gallery world, it's, it's much more to your benefit to have a very distinct visual style and to have your own unique language you're operating in uh, wow. because that's where so much of the, the juice is, you know, like you, you take, uh, you take an artist, like, like we buy your kids for instance. Right. And, and right. They're so they're, they're incredible and they're so visually distinct. There's just no one in the world who's going to make work like they do. But a lot of times when you're working with like a studio, they want you to be a little more of a chameleon. They want you yeah. to make work. That's going to be a little more anonymous. For lack of right. A better word. That makes sense. That totally makes sense. Yeah, I never considered that, but that makes total sense. It's with the studio, it's that traditional poster artist kind of position. You're you're there to make advertising assets. You're there to make merch assets and yeah, uh, exactly. And so versus the gallery, it it is more about you and your brand and your visuals that Very people much. are paying for. I like that. I like that. You pretty much, you have those two options to operate in. Yeah, and I kind of exist in a middle ground anyway. Like, I don't think I really have a unique style. Like, I don't think, just naturally speaking, I'm not someone whose visual language is really that, like, out there or distinguishable. Right. Like, if you put, yeah. I if I didn't make the work myself, I would have a hard time distinguishing my own work, I think. You know, like, I know how I right. work, and I make work... I would like to think as honestly and like open heartedly as possible, but I'm just not that dude who is going to come in with like this wild creative vision for a piece that makes me operate in that nice middle ground. Cause I could do studio work and not 
I don't compromise the way I work when I work for, for studios. I, I work exactly the same as I would for gallery. I, I could, could go both ways with how I work, which is nice. Right. Well, it's, it's funny because you say that you, you don't feel like you you don't have a distinct style, and that's what may, that may make you more attractive to studios. Yeah, I, versus, versus versus someone who's uh, has a very hard on the nose style, and they kind of have to go. Well, we kind of have to wait to see if we ever have a project that works with that style. Yeah, I mean it's type exactly of thing. that, and I think a lot of it is I, I cut my teeth in um, editorial for so long that it was just. Uh, right, yeah. You have to <laughs> learn how to work in every context, and uh, for me, it's always been much more about like the concept and the mood, and the emotion in the piece, versus the actual physical rendering of the piece. Like, right? I don't really care about that. I mean, I, I I want it to look how it looks in my head, and I want it to convey the mood and emotion I want someone to feel when they look at it. But in terms of like the actual strokes or like rendering like i don't know it's a means to an end for me i agree with, i i definitely see where you're coming from i i think i operate in that in that space too i i come from a design world and so advertisement type stuff and just almost working from a i don't want to say a minimal but taking something that may represent something and using that as a poster right yeah but, uh the, so the best i've heard it described was uh do you know you know Vance Kelly? No. Vance is one. I'm one of my favorite artists in the world. Absolutely nice guy, but uh, he he called it "thing is a thing." <laughs> he was like, "Oh, you do that. You do that. You, those pieces where you do a thing is a thing." I'm like, "Yeah, I can't think of a better way to describe it." But it's like the double read, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you so, have like Ollie Moss, like completely close it. I I don't know. I kind of feel like Ollie Moss closed the book on that. Like, no one's gonna do it better. <laughs> Maybe something. See, like I say, I, I definitely come from that that world of, of operating that way, but I also have a very expressive style that I also like to operate in. I like to. It's more of a subconscious thing of like the brush strokes and the rendering that just comes with it. Yeah. So I'm not so much focused on it. It just that well, that's just my hand. It just yeah. happens to be there. No, I, I. By the way, your work is super dope. Um, Thank you. I mean, your work is fantastic. So, uh, but I, I completely agree. Like, I used to teach art college. I taught for like over a dozen years, and uh, the word the word style was like a swear word. You know, like you you're not allowed to say style because style doesn't mean anything, right? That's right. like judging a car by the paint job instead of the engine. It, right, yeah. the surface like who cares what color your your house is painted how many rooms does it have you know right uh and i think people get lost a, a lot of times in the poster world people get really lost in this concept of trying to find a style but it's like it's not something you should actively look for it's something you already are right Th this is yeah. a good way like that i think about it i think is i remember when i was a lot younger and i was applying for my first passport and you have to write in your signature on the passport. And this is what, whatever, 16 year old me is spending a few days trying to like find the coolest signature ever. And I'm like, have sheets and sheets of paper trying to write <laughs> out my signature. And now when I write my signature, it's just how I write my name. It's not something I think about. It's not something I'm putting work into. It's the way my hand moves when I write my name. And right. Now my illustration work, I don't put any thought into like the, f into how I get to the finish line. It's, this is how I know how to work. This is what makes sense to me. And this is what allows me to express my vision as clearly and seamlessly as possible. And yeah. Really the extent that I have a style, it's what you're seeing is my limitations as an artist. Like you're, you're seeing someone who's trying as hard as they can and yeah. what they're capable of doing. That's a good way of saying it. Your style is the limitation of you as an artist. Huh. If you, That's uh, interesting. I, I, I guess I can say this as long as uh, let's hope certain people aren't listening. But um, I, you, so I'm colorblind, right? Not not like black oh. and white, but I can't see right. very large segments of the color wheel. And if you look at my work, it's very um, 
it's very single tone. Like a lot of the rendering is one strong color palette with one very narrow color range. I'm not someone who's capable of using color in like a dramatic or um, complex way. You know, the, my right. use of color is incredibly basic. It's like I go for a mood and find a palette that just hammers home that mood and that's that's what I'm doing. And I like the way I use color. It's 100% a factor of my limitations. It's because right. when I when I was in college, every time I had to render people, I would paint them the same weird shade of green. And uh, my sister called it my Shrek phase, but like <laughs> I would I would get hammered in critiques because the teacher would teachers would be like why is this person green and I'm like oh damn okay oh, yeah. I guess they are um, well what made the most sense for me was to like not work in a representational palette at all avoid avoid trying to be accurate and instead I was like okay if I'm not going to be accurate then I could color for mood and uh, yeah. or concept and that really uh, opened the world up to me. And uh, I don't think I would have found a way of working like that if I didn't have that natural limitation. Yeah, that definitely would form your style. And I, to me, it's almost for the better. Because oh, yeah. with me, I struggled with color for the longest time, like through grade school, all the way to high school. My art teacher tried to help me with color. I struggled. I couldn't it was it was a it was a handicap for me and it wasn't until college that it kind of i took color theory class <laughs> and it kind of opened up for me but at the same time not having to worry about this huge spectrum of color it allows you to kind of like see things differently and are more more focused yeah i mean there are very few artists who can do everything at the same time i mean there certainly are yeah right uh right I'm not one of them. <laughs> I think like I can focus on I'm okay at composition and I'm pretty good with like value rate, like getting my values nailed. But you know that that's 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 my uh, my comfort zone. I mean you had Rich Davies on, right? Right, yeah. Like the way he uses color, I mm -hmm. can't even comprehend it. Like yeah. he did this nightmare on Elm Street piece. That's like Right. I saw that piece and full well knowing I can't see that piece to the extent that he can't <laughs> or intended it, like, I don't get it. I don't get how someone's brain can do that. It, it think in that manner and it, to me it's like so impressive. I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of his work and uh, there's something very fundamental in how, say, he will decide to tackle a piece. And I, I, I haven't talked to him about it, but I get the feeling that like, his ideation is centered around choosing the right colors at, at a very foundational yeah. level. Whereas for me, it's just, um, it's not an afterthought, but it's a much simpler conversation. It's like, okay, this piece feels like it should be purple or this. Right. Yeah. I mean, if, if left to my own devices, everything's pink, pink, pink. I just want to, I want to make my whole portfolio look like pink, but, um, it rarely comes up. I'm the, kind of the same way. I, I don't want to have to fuss about color. I, it's more of like, okay, let me look at the principles. What's complementary, or what, you know, what, what, what simple already principle can I just? Okay, I'll pick this set of colors because they work well together. They have the contrast I'm looking for. Now, unless the poster color has a, a significance, right? Yeah. If I'm trying to say something, okay, I'll, then I'll pick red for this, you know, or the, you know, or your, your typical. Uh, what I've learned now is uh, teal and orange. That's considered cinematic now. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, the, the templates, right? It's like orange and black, and they, yeah, <laughs> teal and orange. Uh, you know what's funny is, like, I was so scared for so long of using green, uh, like accidentally making something green, that for a while I was tilting my blues so hard the other way that all my pieces, I was doing a lot of pieces that were this really weird shade of like desaturated purple. And in my head, it was like this nice, cool blue. And it wasn't until a student pointed it out to me. They're like, oh, what's that purple you use? I really like that purple. 
And I was like, what? I don't have any purple in my portfolio. <laughs> so he was like, pull up your sight on on the projector. And we the class looked at it and they were like, purple, purple, purple. And I was like, oh my God. Uh, oh, it was funny. It was so embarrassing. It was like, I guess it's my signature purple. But <laughs> I was just didn't want it to be green. But wow. uh, yeah, so complimentary colors. I have a lot of pieces with purple and a spot of orange. Because, <laughs> oops. Yeah, it's color, man. It's it can get you can get lost in the weeds with color. Yeah, I, I lately if I have to use representational color, I will just like pull up a film still and color pick out of it, um, and then <laughs> yeah. and then in the very last minute, I'll like do a glaze layer, like a soft light or an overlay layer, with like one right. one color to like unify the piece at like a low opacity. My yeah, my color sense is embarrassingly basic. There's a, there's one artist you may know him. His, uh, what's his what's his name? Let me quickly look him up. Paul Mann. Yeah, I mean Paul Mann. What what, what can you say about him? He's yeah, I mean. <laughs> His use of that 1960s color, right? And oh my God, how do you do that? I mean, do you see things in that way? In the yeah, he, just, he picks the right stuff. I mean, I think the thing with Paul Mann is you look at his work, and out of everyone working in posters right now, he has like one of the strongest foundations of just like raw art fundamentals. Like every yeah. single cover, dude can paint. And I, I think having an analog, like if you learn to paint analog like that uh, and you learn in a more traditional way, I think you have a better grasp. You know, you, you can imagine, right. you know, dude has to mix his own colors. So he, I think having too many yeah. options could be a huge detriment to the way you work. Yes. Yeah. You know, if you, I think that's what it is. Yeah. If you have the whole color wheel at your disposal and you could pick anything at any moment, uh, yeah, I see a lot of artists do this where they just like kind of go a little too wild on colors, and then right, it's it the piece lacks coherence and focus. I, I mean, I think Paul Mann is just like yeah, he's a beast. And I, yeah, yeah, <laughs> he is. And I think that's it's almost I think that's another area where an artist may struggle in finding their style subconsciously, because yeah, when you're doing digitally. You have the whole spectrum at your fingertips, and you can just pick and pick and pick. Versus when you're doing it traditionally, and you're having to mix those colors together, you're gonna pick the colors you want subconsciously and develop that over time. Yeah, it's the same with like rendering technique. Like for the vast majority of my career, I was a uh, ink and brush, and when you work ink and brush, like especially the way I did, it was such a small kit, and it was so limited that it becomes really about the very specifics of the application to get what you need. And the way I work now is those exact same techniques, just fleshed out a bit more with more flexibility digital. But even I use I use Clip Studio for all my work and like all the brushes I use in Clip, I made myself to replicate the same techniques I use on paper. The way I pull strokes on my Cintiq is exactly the same way I pull strokes on paper. It's uh, the process from like my sketchbook to my tablet is one to one, except the tablet I just have a lot more flexibility. Yeah, it's, I guess it's, it's the weird world for me is a lot of the artists I speak to, they have that world of like, yeah, we just translated our tool set from traditional onto digital. And for me, I had this weird, like, almost gap of I worked traditional for a while and then I became a designer, stopped that, went full computer, <laughs> mouse, <laughs> drawing tablet, right? Yeah. And then I got back into, okay, I'm going to be a poster artist. This is what I love. And rekindling that, redeveloping that. So now I'm kind of like, okay, I kind of have to relearn the brush a bit and kind of, like, figure it out and tweak with the brush settings and realizing that's the thing I should be doing and kind of experimenting with that. Yeah, it's uh, having too many options is, is terrifying. I think it is. It's like choice paralysis, right? And if you have that in right. art, 
it becomes hard because you you know like I think everyone has a vision in their head and it's like okay I want to express this and when you only have like a few tools it's a very clear path it's this is going to work or this is not going to work whereas if you have every path in the world available to you it becomes really hard to try to figure out which one connects to your final destination my whole process is just all based around like okay i have a very very linear path even like my ideation is really process oriented it's all like structured uh, and that that also comes from working in editorial is like you don't have time to sit sit around and like daydream about ideas you have a deadline and some of the deadlines are yeah. crazy too you know like New York Times, I've had deadlines there that were three hours for like a, a cover illustration. Right, yep, yep. And it's like, you get the call, you sit down and you move, you you go, and uh, mm -hmm. you have sketches and do in 15 minutes. So there's no time to to connect with your, your soul. You know, it's like, you need to yeah. have a process that's gonna get you to where you need to go efficiently. Yeah, I, I'm right there with you. I, I worked in, I didn't work in so much traditional editorial, but I worked in jur journalism design. Oh, yeah. So you know. we did a lot of uh, stuff that, uh, so I did about five years in that. And so you had your daily stuff, graphics you had to do. But every once in a while, you would get, hey, we want this A1 illustration <laughs> for, this, for Saturday or Sunday's edition. So you had to, like, pump that out along with your other work. So, yeah, I didn't have the time to, like, daydream and be our you know artsy about it yeah to get it together and how to and yeah and have a workflow yeah yeah it's it's hard because i think ideally you want every piece to feel inspired you want every piece to feel like it was just plucked whole from the ether you know like here is my brilliance right. and and sometimes that happens occasionally you'll get a notion of an idea that feels truly inspired for me that that's really rare and, and it's actually even more rare that that inspired idea is going to be the one that art directors pick you know i i've had some ideas that to me were just like you know the the the, the halo around me with like the chorus of angels moment i sketch it up i think it looks dope i i show it to the art director and it's like no we want we want the big head over the scene you know, it's like, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. We already have the big head over the scene. Uh, you know, I, I've learned not to show ideas I don't want to do, but I always have, um, when I'm presenting sketches, there's always a range of like a conservative approach, a balanced approach, and then a radical approach. And I'm always most fired up about the weird stuff. I love the weird stuff, but yeah, uh, it's rare that, that the weird stuff gets picked. Unfortunately, with the bigger so like, do you go ahead? I know I, the bigger the client is, usually the more conservative they are as well. That's I would expect that. Yeah. So, you kind of spoke about like uh, when you're showing sketches. So, do you have like a, a range depending on the client? If it's a bigger client, do you like s send them? Like, okay, here's three sketches, or is it more with a with a big studio? Or do you like okay, no, here's I'm only gonna give you two sketches to choose from. It, it depends, you know, so actually, so lately, uh, when you get develop a really good comfort level with a client, you could start showing thumbnails, which is not something I would do for like a new client because it's like, right. they look bad, you know, frankly. And uh, I mean, I can yeah. show you, there, people could see what I'm doing, right? Over here. Yeah, yeah. Like here are thumbnails for The Mummy. Okay. And there's some thumbnails for Naked Lunch over there. And here's some unreleased stuff or there's the, I, did, oh. I ended up doing that aliens piece i still really want to do this they live piece that's, so cool. that's like a parasite one I, I have to do at some point uh but you know i keep i have hundreds and hundreds of, of these little little sketches i have like a thousand of them in just books and books so uh for some clients i'll just share ideas because these take me a few minutes to do right so if it's not going to work right. I want to know it's not going to work after five minutes of work, not after sketching for five hours on a single sketch that's not going to work. So if I could get to that point, it becomes way more advantageous where I could show a client 12 thumbnails 
that took me a day and have them say like, this has potential, develop this to a sketch versus showing three really beautifully rendered tight sketches and having them say like, none of these ideas are gonna work. Typically though, I will show three sketches to a client. I, I try not to show more. Yeah, three is your, I would think your max. It's yeah, you know, you actually don't wanna give them too many options cause then they just get confused. Yeah. And then they get yeah. like, they hit that choice thing again where they're like, well, I like all of these a little bit. Can you smash them together? And I'm like, yep. no, that's like yeah. binding dinner and dessert into the same dish. Right. That's not going to work. But uh, yeah. <laughs> that, that becomes a problem. But a lot of times with with uh, with with work, you know, the first round sketches, there will be a kernel of something good there that gets developed into a second round or, or sometimes a third round. I think the most tight sketches I've done for a poster has been like eight or nine. Uh, the, the Wolfman and Dracula took me a while to get there on those. And, and a lot of that too is just dealing with limitations. Like Wolfman and Dracula, we didn't have likeness rights on the actors, which presents like a really unique set of problems for pieces that rely on the iconography of the likeness. Right. You know, it's like, there is no movie called Dracula. There's a movie with Bela Lugosi as Dracula. You know, right. his face is the role. His face is right. the movie. It's every, I don't know if you've ever seen that movie. It's not good. Yeah. Bela Lugosi is iconic, but the movie right. itself is like, it's it's yeah it's all him that's, him. that's what makes it if you don't yeah. render his face it's like trying to conceptualize around a roadblock like that is um ex for me is extremely tricky there you know there are some artists who are just like that is their their lane they they could work with like symbolism super well it's not unfortunately not my wheelhouse yeah, I love the work of symbolism, but I agree with you. Something like Dracula, if it's not Bella, his face, then it's some generic Dracula. It's not universal Dracula. Yeah. Uh, it has to be him if you're going to be doing a piece of that Dracula. I had such a dope sketch for that I really wanted to do, which, which unfortunately didn't work out, which was like, uh, you see the woman's face. She's like lying down holding Wolfsbane. And her neck is tilted back, and um, her the shape of her hair and the wolfsbane form, you know, the silhouette of Dracula over her neck. And oh, one day, one day, you know, I got yeah. For every for every piece, I have like six to a dozen ideas I didn't do. So it's like you amass this archive of, of concepts. So they come out. Yeah, I I came across a couple of old posters recently, and I'm like, these there's something there. So I kind of worked on them a bit and, and, and smoothed it out. I'm like, yeah, I'm proud of this. Yeah, these are old, but I'm proud of them. It's always wild to me. Like, I, I love when artists will post other concepts, like on Instagram or whatever. You'll see, like, Matt Taylor will sometimes post up, like, his other sketches. And each one looks like a finished illustration. They're, they're beautiful, but it's like, you see how many great posters are out there, and then you realize there's, like, great concepts for posters, really tight sketches. There's easily triple the amount you know it's like right. it's overwhelming how much stuff is out there i mean i i can't even process it most of the time i like try to stay off instagram now because it's just yeah it is too much what i find fascinating after after seeing your thumbnails it's cause i've i've seen uh kyle lambert's thumbnails right and comparing his thumbnails to your thumbnails yours are a lot more tighter and I like how you flood in black in your thumbnails to show that contrast and, and tonality versus Kyle's. There are a lot more kind of gestural sketches. Yeah, I think I used to work like that. And then I would like look at it the next day and have no clue what I was trying to draw. Uh, I've had that moment a lot where I'd wake up the next morning. I would uh, wake up in the middle of the night with an idea, roll over, grab my grab my notebook, sketch it out and like go to sleep being like, I got it. I, that was, that was, that was it right there. And then I'll wake right. up in the morning, look at it and be like, what was I even thinking? Like, 
what is this? And I still have thumbnails in my books that are like a squiggle that I know in my heart was a brilliant idea that I will never remember what it actually was. The other thing too is like in my thumbnails, the piece is at, at the point the thumbnail is done, my finished piece is 90% done. It's just right. Yeah. Like if you look at my thumbs to my finishes, every single thing is resolved you know two inches tall it's completely right tall. there's no uh, there's no major difference between one and the other because if if it works this big it'll work 24 by 36 yeah yeah there, i love i wish i worked that way to be honest because i 100 percent agree you're right and you don't have to worry about the anxieties of it working later and yeah you, all those decisions have been made they just need to be resolved yeah fully rendered and I'd be like, Zach, you need to work that way. Because <laughs> I work a lot like Kyle with my thumbnails. They're very gestural sketches. And for the most part, I'll know what I'm talking about later on. But I almost wonder if clients prefer thumbnails like yours, because it's more clear, versus thumbnails like how I do them, or Kyle. Because I just, I just today sent some thumbnail, like two sketches to a client. And luckily, they understood it enough to yeah. sign off on it. To, to your point, I'm like, I really should try and... And do it that way. I, I mean, it's like whatever process works for you. I, I know for me, it's um, only gets done if I'm as structured as possible. Uh, and this is like, this is a process that works for me. So I'm not going to try to deviate too much from it. And, and I mean, I think on the other hand, though, it's like, it, is my process creatively limiting? You know, I, I think it could be, right? Because, uh, right. for instance, if you're working this small then there's a lot of really complex composition that is hard to draw small that maybe I'm missing out. Maybe maybe if I worked a little larger, I would be more ambitious. Like, I can't imagine, like say someone like Killian Ang, I'm sure he does thumbnails, but like I can't imagine his work reduced because it's there's such a complexity and richness to his composition and rendering. It's like it, it is hard to reduce. Whereas like the fact that my things can be reduced so easily might mean they're a little too simplistic. I can see it both ways. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's interesting. In I mean, in some aspects though, that restriction that you have on yourself of it it can scale down to a thumbnail size it makes your work easily it's more easily uh consumed on the internet because we all see things in that thumbnail size yeah it, that's a really good <laughs> point I mean, how many people have even ever seen my work moving yeah. your size I, most part most people see your work as a thumbnail yeah on their phones i mean they're versus like 24 by 36 yeah. <laughs> you know there's like 50 people wall. out there who actually own one of my posters and they, they get to enjoy it full size but like yeah i actually even my own work i don't ever see it that big like yeah. my own ap's i don't this is so embarrassing but like for the most part i don't even take them out of their sleeves like I, if I finish a piece, it's, uh, like the second I finish rendering it, it's done for me. I don't look at it again. I don't want to. Tune in next week for chapter two of this episode.